Hello and welcome to Granada Reports, live with the very latest across the northwest. Very good evening to you on the programme this evening. Unsupported, are we failing our teenagers in care? I think if I went into that setting, I'd, I generally just don't think I'd be alive. I wouldn't have been able to cope with the pressure of, of life. Rebuilding the Red Wall in Burnley. Sir Keir Starmer on Labour's levelling up plans. Kickstarting the economy, the Isle of Man unveils a budget aimed at fueling a comeback year after the pandemic. A special day for Tom, the war hero from Salford, getting a military salute to celebrate his 100th birthday. And explorer Steve Backshall on bringing the sea to the stage as his ocean tour stops off in the northwest. Yes, a busy programme tonight, but first, what were you doing at 16? Would you have been able to move out of home and look after yourself? This is the age when thousands of children in care are asked to make potentially life-changing decisions and start to live independently. The charity Article 36 wants to make its law for every child to receive care until they are at least 18. We'll hear from the head of a children's charity based in the North West in a moment, who says children need to be properly supported. But first, this report from Tasha Kachiri, who's been talking to one care leaver who says the current system isn't working and leaving children at risk. There's your ball. Isabel says her care experience was bittersweet. She was in care for seven years. I got care, I guess, in the, the, the practical sense, but not care in, in love, the way that a parent cares for you. At 16, Isabel was given the choice to live in shared accommodation or go back to her biological family. She chose to return to relatives. It wasn't the right decision at all. Do you think you should have been able to make life-changing decisions like that at 16? I don't think that final decision should have been up to me. Um, I think they should have explored other options with me um, that were safer. Thousands of children in care across the UK are living in shared houses, bedsits and hostels. Last year, the government banned this for children under 16. Isabel joined the charity Article 39. They say older children need care too, and the new rules discriminate against 16 and 17 year olds, so they challenged it in court. 22 children uh, in care aged 16 and 17 died between 2018 and 2020. These were children who were living in properties where they weren't receiving any care, any uh, consistent adult supervision, 22 children. 16 and 17 year olds can be put in supported accommodation. The aim is to help them live independently, but they aren't regulated in the same way as homes for children under 16. It's something that Isabel doesn't agree with. You shouldn't be having to balance your bills and your rent in your food shop. You, you should be able to be a child. I think if I went into that setting, I'd, I generally just don't think I'd be alive. I wouldn't have been able to cope with the pressure of, of life. It really like upsets me that the government and many local authorities allow sometimes younger than 16 year olds to live in accommodation like that. They wouldn't expect their own children to experience that but they expect very, very, very vulnerable children to experience that. The Department for Education says supported accommodation can be right for some young people aged 16 or 17, but most will be in children's homes or foster care. They also went on to say we're investing more than £140 million to introduce mandatory national standards, meaning that from 2023, every type of social care placement for children up to 18 will be regulated by Ofsted. But Isabel still thinks more needs to be done. Care should give you the best opportunity in life. You shouldn't have to be really strong and work through care and be one of the lucky ones. Tasha Kachiri, ITV News, St Helens. Well, earlier we spoke to Sue Cotton, who heads up Child Action Northwest, and we asked her about Article 39. Yeah, we also asked her if it is right that children at 16 should be left to look after themselves. Well, my concern with the, the legislation as it is at the moment is from the age of 16 there can be a choice to move children from a caring situation, from being in foster care or being in a registered children's home, into accommodation that is being described as supported accommodation. But what that means is there isn't the support and guidance for those children. They are children who are in effect looking after themselves. 
is this the right age to tell children to try and make their way on their own in the world at 16, 17? Well, you tell me what any parent would say around that. Would it be the right age for your child, your nephew, your niece, your cousin? Most parents wouldn't let their children go off into the world on their own, you know, at 16. Should that apply to foster care as well? These children have, have already experienced significant trauma in their life and at 16 they're still developing, they're still finding their way in the world and I believe that they need the care more then than any time. And I guess the government would say that supported accommodation is available, you mentioned it yourself and what are your concerns with what is available for uh, young people right now? I think legislatively we should make it really clear that the state and the care system is there to care and protect for children, not to give an option that the age of 16 and 17 there can be an accommodation that doesn't have to answer to the same standards. We've just heard from Isabel who said she would not have had survived if she'd been left to live on her own, dealing with her own shopping, her cooking, budgeting. That must be a real worry for you working in the care centre. Oh, absolutely. Um, we, we work with children, we work with children leaving care. And the things that they tell us is they want support. How do they manage their finances? Some of these children might not even have finished their GCSEs, for example, and yet they're being expected to manage their, their own budgets and to work out how much they have got to spend. We know the impact of poverty at the moment anyway and the cost of living, and we're expecting children 16, 17 to navigate those difficulties. Nobody wants teenagers to fall through the cracks. But what are you seeing on the ground? I do think there needs to be extra effort to enable very supportive foster placements to be provided more effectively um, and the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean that it's not the right thing to do simply means that we need to make more effort to do the right thing on that positive note sue cotton thanks for joining us tonight thank you well, next this evening, and the Manchester Arena Inquiry has heard the suicide bomber Salman Abedi had talked about killing people in a public space for years, but the threat was dismissed as bravado and no one thought he would do it. Today, the inquiry heard from a prison officer who was identified by the initials P01, who said he had a conversation on December the 1st last year with a baby's close friend. Our correspondent, Amy Welch, joins us from Manchester now. Amy, what more can you tell us? Well, we can't name that prison officer for legal reasons, but today he told the court about a conversation he had with Abdul Ralph Abdallah, a convicted terrorist who we know Salman Abedi visited in prison. Now, Abdallah gave evidence to the inquiry last November, and just a few days later, he spoke to the prison officer about his shock that one of his boys had committed the arena attack. He didn't name that individual, said that he'd often talked about killing people in public places. He said he talked about it so often that he didn't take what he was saying seriously and said that if he'd had any idea what Salman Abedi was planning, he would have tried to stop him. And Amy, we also heard more about MI5's evidence and that was originally heard behind closed doors, wasn't it? That's right. Many months ago, the decision was made that MI5's evidence regarding what they knew about Salman Abedi would be heard in secret because of concerns it may harm national security if made public. But today, a summary of some of that evidence, 15 pages of it to be precise, was read out to the court. And crucially, two MI5 officers admitted that had they been given more context regarding two pieces of intelligence in relation to Salman Abedi prior to the attack, they may have investigated it further. We don't know what that intelligence was, just that it was dismissed as not important. It wasn't even passed on to counter-terrorism police, but one of those MI5 officers says that that intelligence could have been a pressing security concern. Here's Paul Greeny, QC, the counsel to the inquiry, summarising that point. The MI5 officer who first evaluated one piece of intelligence accepted during questioning that it could be understood at the time to indicate activity of pressing national security concern. Well, the families of the bereaved have concerns about the fact that MI5 was apparently overstretched and struggling to cope with its workload. They want some of those MI5 officers called back to court to give evidence, and that is something the chair of this inquiry, Sir John Saunders, will make a decision about next week.
OK, Amy, thanks for bringing us up to date. To other news now, and Merseyside police are appealing for information after a 12-year-old boy needed hospital treatment after an attack near a park in Wirral. Three men in balaclavas tried to take the boy's coat near the McDonald's on Liscard Road after he'd walked from Central Park. His hand was slashed in the attack on Sunday. A new hub for the government's digital, culture, media and sport departments will be based in Manchester. Around 400 staff will work from the building on Marble Street in the city centre. It's part of a wider plan to level up and create jobs outside of London. Staff from the departments will also be based in Cardiff, Edinburgh and Belfast. The Labour leader was in Burnley today to give his backing to investment in manufacturing for places like Lancashire. Yes, Sir Keir Starmer met staff at a factory in Oldham and spoke about the importance of keeping jobs local. The Conservatives took the Burnley seat from Labour at the last election, but Sir Keir says backing British business is the way to win over local votes. Emma Sweeney has this report. After a turbulent few weeks for the government in Westminster, Labour will be hoping they've stored up enough of a lead in the polls to make a lasting impact. The party leader and shadow levelling up secretary were in Burnley today, a former brick in Labour's red wall taken by the Tories in the last general election. But Labour are hoping to win back votes and say this town needs their support. £28 billion pounds the Labour Party is putting on the table every year for the next generation of jobs. Massive skills uh, agenda. Uh, you know, uh, buy, make and sell in Britain, which means the jobs will be here in Britain. But convincing people here that Labour will produce for them may not be so straightforward. According to a recent survey, people in Burnley distrust politicians more than any other place in the UK. We recognise we needed to change. We've done that piece of work. We've now got a very you know, positive argument to take to the country about skills that we need, about investment in the next generation of jobs. But amidst the cost of living crisis, many people in this town say... They need help right now. That's why we um, have an energy plan that will tax um, the big oil and gas producers. But we also need to get more of these sorts of good jobs back into towns like Burnley. The Conservatives say they are creating jobs in Burnley. The town's been given £20 million of levelling up money to go towards new links between the town centre and Turf Moor, expanding the university campus and improving the local train station. Critics say the money will barely scratch the surface. But what do the people of Burnley think? Half the shops here are closed, aren't it? It's like a dead town. A lot of things going on. New businesses are opening up. I feel like the government could be doing more um, in terms of putting more resources into small businesses in Burnley. With just months to go until the May local elections, Sakia Starmer will be hoping people begin looking to Labour as the party to deliver change. Emma Sweeney, ITV News, Burnley. Well, next, into the spending plans on the Isle of Man with an emphasis on environmental issues and economic growth. Yes, the announcements for next year include an increase to the personal tax allowance rising to £14,500, almost £500 million for capital projects and £42 million to tackle climate change. But like the UK, the island is still coming through a pandemic and some business owners are looking at another uncertain year ahead, as Joshua Stokes now reports. In many ways, life in the Isle of Man has returned to normal. But the same can't be said for its economy. For restaurant owner Mitch, times are still tough. He moved his business to a new location the same week the island went into lockdown. I had no gas connected up, I had no extraction set, uh, set up, so I was effectively dead in the water for 12 weeks until we could get people back to work. So it was horrendous. You know, we all have legacy debts. Uh, rents don't stop, service charges don't stop, standing charges don't stop. I don't think there's a lot of confidence in the marketplace at the moment. You know, it's just fingers crossed every single day. You, you, just, you just hope you, you make enough to make money to pay the bills. How long do you think it will be before you can probably say you've recovered? I think you're looking at the next couple of years, but that is subject to everything going really well. Today, the newly appointed Treasury Minister announced the annual budget. Within it, money assigned to healthcare, capital projects and climate change. 
But the pressure comes from rising inflation. We are seeing inflationary spikes averaging between 6 and 6.5% and at the moment. So we are also setting up a contingency fund for government departments where with their capital programmes, if the only reason that that capital programme is actually coming in over budget is due to inflation, the departments will be able to bid to apply to that fund. I, I think we're in a very good position compared to many of our counterparts. But when talking about the island's finances, there's one annual event that stands out amongst the rest. There he goes with the pat on his shoulder, heading towards Bray Hill, Cameron. This is the scary bit. The Isle of Man TT brings in over £25 million to the Manx economy. So this year, it'll be a welcomed boost to businesses who've been without it for two years. It's very significant. It's our busiest fortnight of the year. Everybody in every industry is aware. Prices have gone up, heating, labour. So... It, the, the world's looking very challenging. We've never been so quiet in a, in a January and early February. But having said that, the bookings onwards into the summer are, are really looking quite strong. And on an island of just 85,000 people, it's visitors who are so vitally needed to kickstart a comeback year from the pandemic. Joshua Stokes, ITV News, in the Isle of Man. Yes, very much looking forward to the TT on the Isle of Man. Now, it's been a very special day for one young man from Salford. Yes, Tom Jones is a Second World War veteran who fought in Burma. Well, last month he celebrated his 100th birthday and today he got an extra special present from the armed forces. Tom was given his very own personal military salute and Paul Crone was there to see it. <laughs> When you're 100 years old and you're called Tom Jones, it's not unusual to celebrate your centenary in style. The former World War II bombardier was surrounded by friends and family today at the Four Housing Extra Care Scheme in Burke Gardens in Walkden. Oh, and the Lancashire Artillery Volunteers Band popped by too. No wonder Tom is in peak condition. I can sit in my flat and uh, watch telly or come down here and talk to somebody. I'm OK. I'm, I feel all right. During World War II, Tom served in the jungles of Burma for four long years with the 103rd Lancashire Volunteers Regiment Royal Artillery and recalls the day a Gurkha saved his life. These Japanese came running out at us and I was kneeling on one knee on the floor sending a Morse message because I was a wireless operator and uh, I hadn't a chance to do anything but this, all of a sudden this Gurkha come round stood in front of me and shot him. Back in Walkden, Tom's family were keen to pay tribute to their granddad. He was brilliant, brilliant when we were kids, yeah, we've all, he's always, never changed, never changed. Never. And who else would have Tom Jones singing to you on your birthday? Yes, we get Tom Jones singing to us on our birthday. We do. There was just time for a quick tour of some artillery courtesy of GOM 103 Regiment and a family photo. A special day for Tom. So just double check, what's your name again? Tom Jones. Ah, is, is that usual? It's not unusual. It's not unusual. <laughs> it's not. Oh, Paul Crown, ITV News. <laughs> Happy birthday, Tom. I hope I look as good as Tom when I'm 100. Yeah, going to have to find out your secret, Tom. Um, OK, time for sport now. And Manchester City's quest to conquer Europe continues this evening, Mike. That's right. After a two-month break, the Champions League is back. Tonight it is the start of the knockout stage of the competition. Manchester City are away to Sporting Lisbon in the first leg of the round of 16. Once again, they are without their record signing Jack Grealish, who's injured. Gabriel Jesus, Cole Palmer and Kyle Walker are also missing. City are hoping to go one better than last season when they were beaten by Chelsea in the final. Their manager says there is great harmony in the squad. Darwin in this team right now and this season is exceptional. In football, the most difficult thing is that every day they are enemies because they have to fight for one position in the team. They are enemies in a nice sense. And after they have to be brothers in the weekend, you know, in the, the game. And that mix is not easy. 
Well, Manchester United are in Champions League action next week. Tonight, their focus is on the Premier League as they take on Brighton at Old Trafford, with manager Ralph Ranić admitting a top-four finish is the best they can hope for this season. He says his players have made it too easy for opponents in recent weeks. United have led 1-0 at half-time in their last three matches, only to be pegged back for draws. Right now, this is uh, exactly what Manchester United needs to want, to finish fourth in the league. I think this is uh, the highest possible uh, uh, achievement that we can get. There is no other things. Yes, the Champions League, hopefully to proceed into the next round in the Champions League, which is also not an easy one. But uh, in the league, currently, it's number four. That's, uh, that's our ambition. That's, this is what we have to achieve and what we are aiming at. Getting that winning feeling. FOW. Sponsors of the Granada Sport Report. Next to a sportswoman who made history in 2021. It was one of the sporting highlights of the year as Rachel Blackmore became the first female jockey to win the Grand National at Aintree. Well, today, Rachel has returned to Merseyside for the official launch of this year's Grand National, where she will once again be going for glory. She's been speaking to David Chisnell. Rachel Blackmore raises the bar still higher. Ten months on from one of the most famous days in the history of the world's most famous horse race, Rachel Blackmore was back in Liverpool. A jockey of the highest quality. As the first female jockey ever to win the Grand National, she was given a guard of honour by the inner city riding school Park Palace Ponies as she arrived for the launch of this year's race. Well, Rachel, how does it feel to be back here on Merseyside? Oh, look, it's fantastic. Uh, any day you fly into Liverpool is a good day and uh, I've great memories of being here. What has life been like for you since that win? Yeah, definitely a bit different. The postman is definitely a bit busier for sure. And uh, yeah, look, it's been great. Everything's been so positive. The 2021 Grand National was unique not only for its winning jockey, but also because it was the first time in its history that it took place behind closed doors. However, with restrictions lifted, 70,000 fans will once again fill the Aintree stands on the big day in April. Liverpool is a very special place. It's something somewhere where, where the locals get involved and it's a big weekend. And um, to have them back there will let everyone see what a special event it is again. One man who will sadly be missing at this year's Grand National is Trevor Hemmings. The three-time winning owner died last year at his home on the Isle of Man. And the jockey who rode his first winner, Hedge Hunter, back in 2005, says he'll be missed. Trevor was a great man um, who got a lot of enjoyment out of his race and, and out of life. He was an incredible businessman. He trained or he owned three great winners of the Grand National and I'm sure he'd be looking down fondly on Grand National Day. Well, all eyes were on Rachel today as this year's list of potential runners and their handicap weights were revealed. So how does it feel coming into this year's race then, knowing you are the defending champion? You know, it's a race you need a lot of luck in, but, you know, we've just seen Tiger Roll and, and, and what he was able to do in backing it up. So, look, I think it's a race that anything is possible. You've created history once. Can you create history again? I don't see why not. Well, Rachel and Minella Times had a winning combination last year. They'll hope to double up again as they both look to do the double at this year's Grand National. David Chisnell, ITV News, Liverpool. Just before I go, it is congratulations to the man they call the Morecambe Missile. TT Races legend John McGuinness received the MBE today from the Princess Royal for services to motorcycle racing. And finally, the very best of luck to Lancashire skier Dave Riding, who's going for gold at the Winter Olympics in Beijing. He's racing in the slalom event in the early hours of the morning. We keep everything crossed for him. We absolutely do. We hope that he brings that medal home. Thanks, Mike. Uh, now, over the last 30 years, popular adventurer Steve Buckshall has done it all. Handled deadly spiders, not for me, and snakes, also not for me, and swam with great white sharks, possibly for me, but his next mission <laughs> is far trickier. Yes, he plans to bring the sea to the stage in his brand new show, Ocean, which stops off in Salford and Buxton later this spring. Our entertainment correspondent, Caroline Whitmore, asked him just how he plans to do that and also had a little friend for him to meet too. Now, if you are squeamish about sharks and snakes, you might want to look away. Of the 50,000 odd species of spider, this is one of the only ones that you genuinely would need to be worried about. Steve Backshaw, we're normally used to seeing you outside. When I found out I was doing a Skype with you, I thought, oh, we'll be inside. Look at you, this is amazing. I'm always outside. I don't even have a house. <laughs>
I'm just living at 10. Just tell, <laughs> us, tell us where you are. Helen, my wife and I live on the banks of the Thames. Um, but it's a really nice stretch of the Thames. And, and, you know, this time of the year in the winter, you barely ever see a boat and you sit here and you feel like you're in a nature reserve. Is there anything you're really scared of? My fears are different to other people. I, I don't have no fears. Things like tarantulas and scorpions and snakes, I, I've been keeping as pets since I was knee high. So I know what the rules are. I, I know what the limits are. I, I am more frightened being in a city centre on a Saturday night after closing time than I would ever be being in the middle of the jungle. I'm four metres away from the cage, but I feel perfectly at ease with her. I've dived outside the cage with great white sharks, which obviously do have the capability of properly harming. It's taken me 30 years of diving with sharks to get to the date where I would consider diving alongside tigers and bulls and makos and, you know, all those sharks that have the capability to, to do us harm and to know when they're not going to. I bet your wife, every time you go off to work, I bet she's like, bye. <laughs> she is far more likely to be thinking, ah. I want to be going and doing that. Talk to me about your tour. Coming to Buxton and Salford later on in the spring. You know, you, you can't ring the ocean inside, can you? Well, that's what you think. <laughs> it's definitely a challenge. The things that I'm going to try and do to bring the ocean to life on the stage are to try and create something of the atmosphere of the ocean, bringing onto stage a life-size replica of that animal. Brought someone to introduce to you. This is Sonic. Hello, Sonic. Not the hedgehog, but Sonic the tortoise, who I think might have just pooed on my hand. What pets do you have? At the moment, we've not got anything because I'm bouncing between traveling so much and Helen has actually spent quite a lot of time away as well. She went to the Tokyo Olympics last year and trying to balance that plus three kids. And I don't think my neighbors would be that chuffed if I was saying to say to them, can you just look after my snakes? Good luck with the tour, Steve. And all my love to Sonic as well. Bye, Steve. Sonic. Bye, Sonic. <laughs> I want to hear more about Sonic. <laughs> we like Sonic, not the spiders. Now for the weather. Here's John. He's cooked up a storm and now he's going to scrape the fat into the bin instead of the sink. My guy. United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Hang on. What's that fish? Hello again. Now, you must have heard by now there's some stormy weather to come for the second half of this week. Storm Dudley coming through late tomorrow evening, early hours of Thursday, gusts possible to 80 miles per hour. And we have a full moon at the moment, so some high tides, so we're likely to get some overtopping on the likes of the Lancashire coast. So let's take a look at see how things are shaping up. Uh, plenty of isobars coming through tomorrow. There's Storm Dudley and a reminder of a Met Office warning, an amber warning through tomorrow evening and into the early hours of Thursday. Gusts up to 80 miles per hour. Things a little bit quieter during the day on Thursday and then Friday the next storm comes through. Storm Eunice, some more gale force winds and potentially some snow, especially over higher ground. So let's wind back through to this evening. Some rain moving in from the southwest, some wet and windy weather coming through, but uh, the rain tending to ease off later on tonight. But the winds will really pick up by morning gusts to 45 miles per hour. Now, there are your sun times for tomorrow in the morning, rising at 7.29, setting again at 5.22. So tomorrow morning then it's bright enough to start with but it won't be too long before wet and windy weather sweeps in from the southwest so winds really winding themselves up and by tomorrow afternoon gusts 60 miles per hour it's relatively mild temperatures up to 13 celsius and then through tomorrow evening the amber warning kicks in gusts up to 80 miles per hour thursday the winds will gradually ease off for a short time before more wet and windy weather moves in during the course of friday that's it enjoy your evening United Utilities sponsors ITV Granada Weather. Bob, Bob! I'm here. And uh, that's just about it for tonight's programme. On our website, the hero lorry driver from Burnley who saved a motorist in a dramatic rescue. That's well worth a read. And on tomorrow's programme, as you heard from Mike, going for gold with Lancashire's gear, Dave Riding will be with his supporters. Yes, good luck, Dave. We've got everything crossed for you. We could do with a medal coming to Lancashire. We absolutely could. Good, good night. night.